Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for the lecture, How Can Tricalcium Silicate Cement Improve My Clinical Practice? All Septodontim is very happy to welcome Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel, it's a pleasure to welcome you today for this new webinar. Thank you very much for your participation. We will have around 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions. Uh, as you know, the mics are in mute, so please use the chat on your right hand side and we will answer to all your questions at the end. Dr. Patel, thank you again and uh, I'll let you begin. Okay, thank you um, Emily for that very kind introduction. Um, and I just want to start by thanking um, the Septodont team for inviting me to be here today um, to deliver this webinar on this interesting topic. Um, how can calcium silicate cements improve my clinical practice? So to start with, um, I'm going through the aims and objectives of today. Um, the first is to discuss the advantages of using calcium silicate cements. I'm going to be reviewing the applications of biodentine um, and then focusing a little bit more on actually pulp capping and fication repair, um, fication uh, perforation repair. So um, the initial part of today's webinar will be a little bit more based on the um, biological aspects of calcium silicate cements. Um, and then the sort of second half of it will be mainly clinical. So we're going to be going through clinical cases um, to show you how to pulp cap and how to repair these fication perforations. So to start with a little bit about me. Um, I mainly work in specialist practice um, in the UK. I'm based between two practices, uh, one in South London um, and the other in Reading. Um, and I work mainly on an external referral basis. Um, so this is my room. Um, it's got a picture of my microscope and I've got a camera attached to my microscope. Um, I tend to take a lot of photos um, during my uh, work. And I find this really useful, not only for uh, my referring dentists, because they can actually see what's taking place when I see the patients, um, but also for patients, because if you take a photo, um, the patient will suddenly understand the type of treatment that you're doing. So, for example, if I'm treating a tooth with a crack, normally I'll take a photo of it and show the patient. Um, and you almost see this light go off in their eyes. They suddenly understand um, everything that you're doing. And um, so I really do encourage people to take more photographs of their work. It's great sort of for you to self learn as well. I also um, do some teaching. Um, so one day a week I work as a clinical teacher um, at Guy's Dental Hospital for King's College London um, on the endodontic specialist program that we have there. Um, and this photo at the top, um, you can see, was taken at uh, the European Society of Endodontology Conference in Vienna. Um, and the team is headed by Professor Minocci, who's in the centre there. I also do quite a bit of private education um, and I'm very passionate about teaching. I, I really enjoy it. So moving on to the applications of biodentine. So it can be used for many things. Um, firstly, starting with uh, the replacement of um, tooth tissue, so dentine, that's been um, removed by caries. Um, we can use it for perforation repairs. We can use it for the repair of resorption. Um, we can use it as a retrofilling when we're doing apical surgery. We can use it um, to mend pulp exposures um, and to do pulpotomy procedures. And we can also use it for apexification and revascularization. So this is just a brief overview, um, and I'm going to be going into a lot more detail uh, about some of these procedures. So biodentine was launched in 2009, um, so it's very well established in the marketplace. Um, there's a lot of evidence that surrounds um, a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about today. And I've tried to reference um, the articles that I'm using as much as possible, um, and they'll be placed at the bottom of the slide. So if you're interested, um, you can learn a little bit more about them um, later on. So the composition of biolentine is mainly based with a powder and a liquid. The powder contains tricalcium silicate, which is its main component. We also have dicalcium silicate, which is its second main component. Um, it contains calcium carbonate, which is basically a filler. Zirconium dioxide, which is uh, responsible for making the material radio-opaque. Um, and iron oxide, which is responsible for the shade of the material. The liquid contains calcium chloride, um, which is an accelerator. Um, and it means that the material will actually set uh, much faster than other calcium silicate cements. It contains a hydrosoluble polymer, um, which is responsible, it's sort of a water reducing agent and responsible for its consistency, um, and also water. 
So if we uh, consider this case, um, this patient presented to me with symptoms of reversible pulpitis. Um, so you can see here, um, the caries uh, distally is very close to pulp. Um, it's a little bit subgingival as well. And we can see that the pulp horn is actually retreated away. Um, so there's some sort of healing um, that's going on here in the pulp retreating away from the caries. And there's no obvious um, periapical lesion. So for a tooth like this, um, you know, the patient typically complains of a short, sharp pain, um, usually to a stimulus. Um, so we're not getting any continuous ache, we're not getting any long lasting pain, no pain to hot, you know, very typical symptoms of reversible pulpitis. And in patients like this, what we want to do is try and preserve the pulp. The pulp provides so many benefits um, to the tooth. Um, so, you know, it's responsible for things like proprioception, um, there's natural defense cells that, you know, that um, are present in the pulp. Um, whenever we do root canal treatment, although, you know, if we do a good root canal treatment, it's very likely to be successful, um, there's still always a success rate involved with root canal treatment. Um, so if we can try and preserve the pulp, it's a lot better. Also, root treated teeth are more likely to fracture. Um, so, you know, it's really important if we can preserve the pulp to do so. So this is an interesting paper um, because it's always curious if a patient comes to you with um, symptoms of reversible pulpitis, is that a true representation of what's going in, um, sort of what's happening in the pulp? So what this paper did, um, it was by Ricucci et al in 2014, and they took um, 95 uh, teeth, um, so different patients, and they asked that patient um, what symptoms they were getting. Uh, following that, they classified um, the patient into a clinical diagnosis of reversible pulpitis or irreversible pulpitis, depending on what the patient told them. After that, they took the teeth out and they actually, actually histologically looked at what was going on in the pulp um, to see if it matched the clinical diagnosis. And what they found was if the patient complains of symptoms of reversible pulpitis, Histologically, 96.6%, so really, you know, really high percentage of them actually had reversible um, inflammation of the nerve. If they complained of symptoms of irreversible pulpitis, about 84% of the time that was correct. So you can see actually sometimes patients complain of irreversible pulpitis, but it could be um, in a reversible state. But still pretty high percentages, so there is a good correlation between the patient's symptoms that they're complaining of and what's going on. So if we're going to be treating this, um, if I fully remove the caries in this case, um, so we get my burr um, and we remove the caries in its totality, there's a high, high chance that we're going to expose the pulp. And what we know is that the success rate for direct pulp caps is not that great. Um, so if we look at this study done in um, 2000 by Bartholotal, you can see that the failure rate for direct pulp caps at five years was 45% and at 10 years was 80%. Now we have to take this sort of a, with a little bit of a, a pinch of salt because this study was a retrospective study um, and it looked at the direct pulp cap carried out by students. Um, so sometimes rubber dam wasn't used, the materials that were used for the pulp cap were a little bit more dated um, than what we're using now, so they weren't using tricalcium silicate cements. Um, so Likely the, the success rate for direct pulp cap is much better than this if it's done correctly. But at the same time, ideally, we don't want to expose the pulp because it has a much higher failure rate compared to an indirect pulp cap. So trying to avoid pulp exposure is, is really important in these cases. This is a really good position statement um, from the ESC that came out um, that talked about the management of deep caries and the exposed pulp. Um, and it sort of combines the literature that's there and, and gives recommendations. So in brief, what it talks about um, is selective carious tissue removal. So what this means um, is instead of uh, non-carious selective, non-selective carious tissue removal, where we remove everything, in this case, we're actually choosing where to remove the caries. So we remove it in the peripheral aspect of the tooth, um, especially where the CEJ is along the margins of our um, restoration. But we might want to leave slightly um, softer or firm dentine over the pulp. So if we look at the definitions that it talks about, um, there's the definition of soft dentine, which means that we can remove it using hand um, instruments such as an excavator. 
There's firm dentine, which means that it's resistant to hand instruments, but if we used a slow handpiece and a burr, we'd be able to remove um, this type of dentine. And then there's hard dentine, so sound dentine, that when you sort of scrape it with a probe, um, it's gonna make a scratching sound, um, and it's very resistant to penetration with the probe. So what, what we sort of aim for is to um, selectively remove this caries, leaving either soft or firm dentine over the pulp to avoid a pulp exposure. And that's what sort of the best way to treat this is. And there's two types um, within this. There's a one stage technique where we remove um, the peripheral uh, caries. We're leaving sort of soft or firm dentine just over the pulp to prevent the exposure. And we cover everything over with a direct restoration straight away. Um, and then we compare this to a stepwise technique. So stepwise technique is where we, again, do the same process, but we leave a temporary restoration with the view to come back into it um, at a later stage and finish off the caries removal. In my opinion, I think the one stage technique is a lot better um, because we know every time we go into a restoration and we drill a tooth, um, we're likely to cause an insult to the pulp. And there's good evidence now that the one stage technique works well, um, as long as the margin of the restoration is completely clean um, and we've got a well sealed restoration on the top, for example, a composite. If we do this sort of technique, we need to review the patient at six months um, in to do their sort of clinical assessment and take a periapical um, radiograph at one year. So what we're trying to do with this pulp cap um, is um, create this dentine bridge. So we can see here, this is the pulp. We've got a capping cement that's been placed over it and a permanent filling that's on the top. And what we're aiming for is a tertiary dentine bridge. So for the pulp um, and the odontoblasts that line the pulp to form this bridge. And a good capping cement will mean that the bridge that's formed is much better. Now there's two types of dentine bridge. One is a reactionary, um, reactionary dentine, and the second is reparative dentine. And the difference is, is that um, primary odontoblasts, so odontoblasts that are already um, sort of surrounding the pulp will form reactionary dentine. But if the insult to the pulp has been a little bit more what happens is those that odontoblasts are damaged and die, um, and new odontoblasts have to be formed from the stem cells that naturally live in the pulp. Um, so stem cells will then differentiate into odontoblast and then form reparative dentine. So it's a little bit more irregular when that, when that happens. So with pulp capping, does the material matter that we pulp cap with? Well, traditionally, calcium hydroxide has been used for pulp capping. Um, whether it's an indirect pulp cap or a direct pulp cap. But studies have shown that this is not ideal because it doesn't actually adhere to dentine. There's no actual stick, no seal. Um, and it also therefore provides less surface area for bonding of your, um, of your other material, for example, the composite that you're gonna place on top. It's also been shown to degrade over time and it loses its antibacterial properties. The calcium hydroxide is very alkaline when it's first placed, um, but this quickly gets um, degraded and, and lost. And also the tertiary dentine bridge that's formed as a result of calcium hydroxide being put down um, is quite thin. There is a layer of necrosis because the calcium hydroxide stimulates inflammation in the pulp, um, which lays down this, um, so that the initial cell layer dies and forms this layer of necrosis. And the bridge that's formed has little defects in it. So it has little tunnel defects and cellular inclusions, which means it's not you know, a very um, solid structure. The newer um, uh, sort of products that were launched were calcium silicate cements. So something like biodentine or MTA. And the benefits of this are they bond to dentine so that the seal you get um, by your, your indirect or your direct pulp cap is excellent. Um, it's very antibacterial, so again, very alkaline um, when it's placed. It doesn't degrade um, over time. It's also very biocompatible, which means we get much less inflammation when it's placed down. It sort of goes one step further, and it's actually really bioactive, um, which means that it induces some positive changes in the pulp as well. And as a result, the tertiary dentine bridge that's laid down is laid down a lot faster. Um, it's a lot thicker and it has much um, fewer tunnel defects, so it's a better bridge. And if we look at the sort of meaning of bioactivity, um, these images were taken from um, a paper by Nawika et al, 
um, and it's a histological slide. Um, now, when I had to learn histology at university, it used to make me go to sleep, so I, I hope um, you're staying awake for this part. Uh, it's not very long. Um, so this is the pulp here. This is the surrounding dentine. And this has been um, an exposure of the pulp. And we can see that biodentine has been placed as a pulp capping agent. And this is the dentine bridge that's formed here. Um, this lower image um, shows again, this is the dentine bridge that's been laid down. Um, and we show um, the, um, the tooth also, the pulp has these layer of odontoblasts, these intact odontoblasts, um, and the ref there's reformation of um, dentinal tubules as well. So the benefit of using um, a tricalcium silicate cement is it initiates mineralization or dentinogenesis. It's been shown to stimulate growth factors from the pulp. Um, so transforming growth factor beta has been released. And what this does is it actually um, causes stem cells in the pulp um, to differentiate into odontoblasts and they're recruited um, towards the dentine bridge to form a better dentine bridge. So there's quite a significant difference between tricalcium silicate cements and calcium hydroxide. Preparing biodentine, um, it, it sort of has to be prepared well in order for you to get the best mechanical properties out of it um, and for you to um, have good consistency. So I've just made this short video um, on how you uh, mix it. Hi guys, my name is Kareem Patel and I'm a specialist in endodontics. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to mix biodentine. So in your um, biodentine box, you will have um, this uh, silver packet which contains the biodentine powder. We also have um, this uh, little capsule which contains the liquid um, and you have a spatula. It also comes with an instruction sheet um, so you know exactly what you're doing. So I'm opening um, the capsule first. Put it a little cap so that the powder sits in the bottom of the capsule when you open it. Um, and you want to twist the lid off um, the liquid. Once that's done, give the liquid a little flip so that the liquid sits in the bottom of the capsule. You open where the powder is, so you can see the powder in there. And you want to do five continuous drops. So focus in on this and we'll do one, two, three, four, and five. So continuous drops, don't let it, don't let the air come back in. After you've done that, put the lid on. And now we're ready to mix. Uh, we mix it for 30 seconds. When you open it, you will get your biodentine out. Um, you can use this spatula just to scrape it out. And you can see it's quite a nice consistency that we can um, play with and, and put in as we need. Okay, lovely. So talking about the advantages now of biodentine, um, the first thing is it's got good handling. Um, so it's much better than um, MTA, um, which sort of is a difficult one to mix um, and also to handle. You can see that with the consistency that we see here, um, it's got a good handling um, capacity. Also, a big advantage is that biodentine doesn't cause discoloration. Um, so the radiopacifier in MTA is bismuth oxide. Um, and that makes um, makes it radiopaque, but it also discolors the tooth, and we get this sort of blue grey discoloration, which is really sort of nearly you know nearly impossible to remove when it's been um, placed. You almost have to cut away um, the MTA again um, and whiten the tooth. Whereas biodentine um, contains zirconium dioxide as a radiopacifier, which means that it doesn't discolor the tooth, and that's particularly important um, in a tooth like this, which is an anterior tooth. Um, so this tooth had an enamel uh, dentine fracture and you can see here, um, you know, if we need to do a pulp cap here, we want something that's not going to discolour the tooth. Um, so big advantage of that. Another advantage is that the setting time of biodentine is 9 to 12 minutes, um, which is a lot faster than any other silic uh, tricalcium silicate on the market. Um, you know, not those that are light cured, but, um, you know, any, any normal one, for example, MTA. Um, and the setting reaction of tricalcium silicate cements is with a hydration reaction. 
Um, so we get calcium hydroxide release, which was responsible for the um, alkalinity. Um, but calcium chloride um, and the hydrosoluble polymer are things that um, are, they're accelerators, and that that what that's what gives the setting time um, a much shorter a much shorter setting time compared to MTA. Um, and it's a big advantage because it means that we can actually finish um, um, the treatment maybe in one session um, compared to with MTA, where we have to put a damp cotton wool pledge it onto it and return and finish treatment at a separate stage. So. Um, let's talk about indirect pulp capping and how we do it. So getting more into sort of the juicy stuff of how we actually do this sort of procedure. So the first thing we do um, is place a rubber dam. It's really important whenever we're working in close proximity to the pulp um, that we put a rubber dam on. Um, indirect pulp caps and, you know, even direct pulp caps, um, they rely on the fact that we're going to get a very good seal with our restoration. So, for example, our composite restoration um, has to be really well sealed on the margin um, for us to not get leakage and then not get um, caries progression underneath um, pulp capping materials. So rubber dam is really essential. Then um, we want to remove caries. Um, so complete caries removal at the CEJ. And if you want to leave um, soft or firm dentine over the pulp, like we talked about, to prevent a, a pulpal exposure, then that's acceptable. Now, we can use biodentine in two ways. The first is the two-step procedure, and this is where we fill the whole cavity with biodentine. Um, and then after about two weeks or so, um, you can leave it for a little bit longer, but at a separate visit, you cut back the biodentine and place a composite restoration um, or, or you know, a permanent restoration. The second way we can place it is in one stage. So this is where we um, replace the dentine portion um, of the tooth uh, with biodentine, um, and then we put a composite restoration on straight away. And this is really what I've started doing more recently. Um, I think that it's much nicer for the patient because everything is done in one stage. Um, I think the main concerns um, with putting composite directly onto biodentine um, were some of the sort of concerns that I had, um, and it was, you know, that biodentine, when it's initially placed, um, it's quite a delicate material. It takes some time to sort of fully develop its strength um, and to fully develop its seal. So if we put composite straight away, um, with composite, it can polymerize, you know, we get polymerization shrinkage. And there was always a risk that maybe the biodentine was being pulled away from, um, pulled away from the pulp and um, creating a space between your pulp cap and, and the pulp. Now, I think actually, um, that's not so much of an issue if you put quite a thick layer of biodentine down. So don't use it in thin section and uh, put at least a two, two millimeter layer in. Um, and then I think that gives it enough time for the composite to um, uh, not cause too many issues with it. So we're going to look at this case together. This is a patient that I saw. They had a, a caries here. Um, they had other caries lesions as well that their general dentist was going to deal with, um, but they were really referred to me for this, um, this one down here. Again, the patient had symptoms of reversible pulpitis, um, and we can see because the caries is quite close to pulp, um, it was a taste that I typically would think, okay, this needs biodentine. Um, this was the postoperative result. Um, we can see here, this is a, the sort of bulk fill composite. There's a layer of composite, um, so sort of normal composite on top of that. And you can't actually see the biodentine pulp cap very well. That would be the one sort of negative of biodentine um, that, that sort of I could think of. Um, the fact that it isn't very radiopaque. It's got a similar, just over radiopacity to dentine. Um, so sometimes you can't always see it very well on a radiograph. I've got a video of how I treated the case, so you can have a little look. So you can see here, this is the caries. The first thing um, to do is to put a rubber dam onto this. So this is the rubber dam on, got a well-sealed rubber dam. Then fast hand piece um, to remove the um, enamel, the, the undermined enamel. We're then gonna use a, far, a sort of a slow hand piece um, to remove the bulk of the caries. Usually I'll use, um, a, a, so, so quite a large burr when we're working close to pulp because it helps prevent um, you know, um, the burr being pushed into pulp. Um, and on the margins of the restoration is where I use a, a smaller rose head. Here we can see that um, we've got a soft, uh, uh, firm caries um, just over pulp. I can't remove any more with a hand excavator. 
So we've not had to leave any soft caries here. Sorry, soft dentine. And then I will generally always clean the cavity um, with a hypochlorite, uh, sort of damp hypochlorite uh, cotton pledget just to get things um, nice and clean. And this is the first layer of biodentine that's gone in. So what I've done is placed a tiny bit of the liquid of the biodentine just over where I'm going to be placing the biodentine. Because then when you put the first um, increment of biodentine, it tends to spread quite nicely and it's a lot easier to handle. So this is another little bit going in. I'm not packing it at this stage. I'm just gently pushing it um, just so it sort of becomes one with the, the first layer of biodentine that's under it. You don't really want to pack um, biodentine like amalgam, for example. You know, it's more of a gentle placement and push technique. Um, the main thing that I'm trying to do here is not get the biodentine on the peripheral walls because I want a good bond with my composite there. Um, and it's a little bit of a pain to remove it once it's um, sort of splattered all over the walls. So if you can use it in a sort of very controlled technique, it's so much better. You can see as I tilt my mirror, the CEJ is um, completely clear. Um, and then wait 12 minutes. You need to set a timer really and wait the full 12 minutes um, before you do anything else to biodentine. And then etch, um, wash and um, put the composite on top. And you can see it's quite a sort of predictable way to, to place it. If it does get on the walls, you can remove it um, using a slow hand piece um, and you know, then, then sort of wash it. But you do have to be a little bit careful with that initial layer that, that's been placed. And that's because initially um, the bond to a biodentine um, to dentine is not, um, you, you know, it's not very good. It takes time for that bond to um, develop fully. So you have to, whenever you've put it on, if you have got it on the walls of the cavity, just make sure you sort of very carefully remove it without touching the bulk of it. However, the long-term um, seal of biodentine to dentine is excellent. Um, and there's been shown that, you know, this is an active site, it develops over time. Um, and you get this crystal growth within the dentinal tubules um, and potentially iron exchange between the dentine and biodentine to get a really good seal long term. So when you come back, so you've done a two-stage two technique and you're coming back a couple of weeks later to remove um, the biodentine um, and put a composite on top, at that point you don't have to worry about it. It's very well sealed. It's only if you're doing the one-stage technique that you need to be a little bit more careful with the material um, in the first instance. Also, the compressive strength of biodentine is pretty impressive. So um, this is really important for a material that we're using to replace a bulk of dentine, um, because obviously when we're biting on the tooth, we don't want something that's weak underneath. Um, but like the seal, it takes some time to develop. So after about an hour, the compressive strength of biodentine is about 100 MPA. Um, after the next sort of one to seven days, that doubles to 200 MPA. And after a month, it's about 300 MPA which is very similar to natural dentine, which is 297 MPA. So it can be really you know, used in a bulk um, placement to replace dentine. And you can see actually the compressive strength is a lot better than, um, for example, MTA or GIC. It does wear, however, so you, the um, occlusal part, the occlusal two millimeters does have to be re replaced with composite. Um, even if you do sort of the two stage technique, um, I would say after about two weeks to a month, ideally come back and replace it with a composite. You can sort of leave it a little bit longer than that um, if you need to, um, but you just need to be a little bit careful because it does wear um, a lot more than um, some other materials. So moving on to doing a direct pulp cap. So this was um, a patient that was referred to me to manage this lower, uh, lower seven tooth. Um, they had a restoration placed and they were still getting symptoms. Um, it was mainly of reversible pulpitis. Um, they were initially referred to me for a root canal treatment, um, but I said to them, you know, ideally if we can preserve the pulp here, um, that would be better. And the patient um, and the dentist was sort of keen to explore that option. So first thing, again, making sure that you've got a, a rubber dam in place. Then removing the caries, very similar to what we did before. And this is after um, the caries removal. Unfortunately, um, after this, there was a small exposure. Um, so you can see here, there was a, a small exposure that's occurred. Um, initially, this was bleeding. 
Um, but when we do direct pulp caps, what we want to do is make sure that we've got good hemostasis um, before um, we put a pulp capping material over it. The way I normally do this is get a sterile um, cotton pledget, um, similar to what I did in the, the, the video that you saw of the um, indirect pulp cap. You get a, a sterile cotton pledget, I put a little bit of hypochlorite into it, I then squeeze all the hypochlorite out, so we've just got this damp pledget. Um, and then I run that over the full surface of the cavity um, and I leave it for about two minutes over the pulp exposure. And that should give good hemostasis, provided that pulp um, is in a reversible inflama inflama uh, inflammatory state. If it's in an irreversible inflammatory state, then obviously the bleeding won't stop. And then we have to think about um, either doing a partial pulpotomy or proceeding to do um, a root canal treatment. In this case, we can see that we got good hemostasis. So then I put the biodentine on top, um, waited 12 minutes. Then for, in this case, I covered it with a resin modified GIC, make sure the margins of the restoration are totally clear. Um, and then I put a composite on top of that. So everything was done in one stage um, and this was before and this is after. I've actually um, changed the way I manage these cases a little bit. Um, so what I would do now is actually build up um, the walls of the cavity first. Um, so I've got a sectional matrix band here. You can see what I would do is actually put a composite on the external aspect of that so that now I've got four walls that I'm working on. Um, I would then put a thicker layer of biodentine. So how I've left it quite thin here, um, and I've had to then cover it with a resin modified GIC, I would actually now put a much thicker layer of biodentine in, um, wait for that to set, and then put a composite directly on top. Having four walls for the access makes a really big difference because it means that you can put the, bio, um, the biodentine in, um, in a much more sort of specific area without worrying about it getting on the walls. Um, because again, when it does get on the walls, it's a bit of a faff having to try and remove it from the walls because it's still delicate in that initial stage. So now moving on to cases of irreversible pulpitis. Um, so you can see here this lower seven, it's got extensive caries, very close to pulp. Um, we've got open apices, no lesion here, um, just wide apices. Um, and this tooth is in a state of irreversible pulpitis. Um, so the patient's getting pain with hot, um, sort of continuous ache. Um, and the options here are firstly to do a root canal treatment. We could extract the tooth or we could consider a partial pulpotomy or a full pulpotomy. So these options for um, immature teeth have been well explored and are well established. Um, and in this sort of uh, case, doing a pulpotomy and preserving the pulp in the um, roots would make a really big difference to this tooth's long-term prognosis. Firstly, you'd get continued root development, um, so you'd get a better crown root ratio than we have at the moment. But also the dentine walls in the root would become thicker um, and it would minimise the risk of having a vertical root fracture occur in the future. So, you know, definitely something um, that would be worth exploring, especially in this case. But actually, um, the full pulpotomy procedure has also um, more recently been explored in mature molar teeth with irreversible pulpitis. And this is a study by Taha um, in 2018. Um, and what they did was um, exactly that. So they did a full pulpotomy using biodentine in adult patients with symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. And at their one year recall, they had um, you know, quite a good recall rate here and they had 100% um, clinical success, 98% radiographic success. And these patients, obviously, they're coming with quite severe pain if they've got irreversible pulpitis. And 94% of them had complete pain relief within two days. Um, so the, you know, the initial sort of studies are showing very positive outcomes for the full pulpotomy procedure. Um, this was a case um, that uh, a full pulpotomy was carried out. Um, I have to thank Tiago um, here for lending me this case. This is a case that he carried out um, um, of this uh, lower uh, six here. Um, the, the case is actually part of a, a clinical study that's occurring at Guy's Hospital at the moment um, under um, Professor Minocci, who heads the department. Um, and Neha and Tiago are doing sort of their PhD um, research on, on this sort of topic. So I'm just going to walk you through um, this procedure. So what they initially do is remove any soft caries with a hand excavator. 
Once that's done, they put a rubber dam on. So you can see here, this is still very carious, but all the very you know, soft, um, significant amount of caries has been removed. After the caries um, has been mostly removed, they make sure that they don't expose the pulp at this stage. And then um, they uh, get a fast handpiece and they um, remove the pulp up to the canal orifices with a fast handpiece. At that point, they assess the bleeding. So you can see here, it's bleeding quite significantly. They arrest the bleeding uh, with a cotton pledget, with, uh, which has been soaked in sodium hypochlorite, and they put a dry cotton pledget on top. They wait two minutes and have a look and assess the bleeding. And this is what you see it um, after that sort of period of time. So you can see that the pulp is still present in the root canals at the canal orifice level um, and everything else is clean and it's not bleeding anymore. If it does um, still continue to bleed, you can repeat this procedure um, with the cotton pledgets um, to see if that arrests the bleeding. Um, and at that point, if it doesn't, you're probably thinking this tooth needs a root canal treatment. So once that's been done, um, they put a three millimeter le thick layer of biodentine um, over the pulp and then restore the tooth with a resin modified GIC on top of that and a composite restoration. And you can see here, um, this was the preoperative radiograph. This is a 15 month review. Again, you can see the biodentine has been placed here. It's not very radio opaque, but you can see that it definitely it's been um, placed in this area here. Um, and this is the 15 month review CBCT. Um, showing no lesion. Um, and I'm told by Tiago that the tooth responded well um, at 15 months to sensibility testing. So this is something to definitely explore in the future. Um, at the moment in my clinical practice, I'm not doing um, the full popotomy procedure for cases like this, mainly because I'm still waiting for the evidence to come out um, to show um, you know, that this works well um, long term. My main sort of concern with it, with it was um, at the moment to do a root canal on a, a case like this would be fairly straightforward. Um, and after the popotomy procedure, potentially we would get some calcification um, of the canals, which would mean that actually that root canal turns from an easy root canal to a very difficult root canal, um, which may cause problems. Um, but from the Taha study, they've, um, you know, they looked at that complication and they haven't found um, that that's really the case. So this is a, you know, a fantastic option that we may need to explore a little bit further in the future. So moving on to the next topic, which is perforations. This photo was taken from probably one of the worst perforations I've seen. Um, you can see here, this area down here is a perforation. It's pretty much the whole floor of the pulp. Um, and you can see here, this is the palatal canal where the, the pulp actually lies. So the best way to um, fix a perforation is, is not to cause one in the first place. So you can see here, this is a um, upper five that was referred to me for root canal treatment. Now I was already a little bit suspicious because I can see that the access that's already been made is um, not quite at the right angle. Um, and you can see that the root is actually at a slightly different angle. Now this tooth, um, before it was extirpated, had a temporary crown on it. Um, so when the dentist extirpated it, they probably would have assumed that the root lay at this sort of angle, you know, the similar angle to where the, um, the, teeth, the other teeth are sort of lying. Um, so it's really important to examine your preoperative radiograph. This is after the crown uh, was removed, the temporary crown. Um, you can see that there's some caries here. But straight away, I saw that there was a perforation um, on the mesial aspect of the tooth here. This is where the true canal lies. Um, and this is after the caries was removed. And you can see again, the arrow is pointing to the perforation. And this area here is where the true canal lies. So the way we can avoid this is to really analyze our preoperative radiographs, have a look, okay, is the root at the right angle or is it more distally orientated? And then you can angle your burr accordingly. So it's the same with anterior teeth. The most common place to perforate an anterior tooth is buccally. So trying to go in with a burr like this um, would mean that we're sort of very likely to perforate buccally. What you really want to do is orientate your burr parallel to the labial surface of the crown. Um, and we would expect to find the canal at the level of the CEJ, um, bang in the middle of the root. This is a few examples of um, teeth that I've seen that are, have been perforated. Um, this patient was referred to me for the root canal treatment of this upper central incisor. And you can see here, this is the cone beam CT. 
Um, this tooth has been obturated actually, um, and you can see right here, this has been obturated to sort of the perforation in the buccal aspect, but the true canal hasn't been found. This is what that tooth looked like clinically. Um, so the arrow is actually pointing to the perforation, um, and we can see that the true canal is much more palatal, um, which is here. So in this case, I mended the perforation and then um, cleaned the, the, the main canal out. And um, this is another perforation, lower central incisors, probably the easiest tooth in the mouth to perforate. And this is a buccal perforation. You can see the burr mark um, that's actually totally sort of super crestal, super gingival. So how do we repair anterior perforations? So this patient um, presented to me um, and was referred for the root canal retreatment of the upper left one and upper left two. Um, you can see there's large lesions um, associated and poor existing root canal treatment. So I just thought it would be a matter of, you know, repeating the root canals and you will get resolution of this um, infection. But when I open the tooth, you can see here, we've got two large buccal perforations um, and where the GP is coming out, that's where the true canal was. So this is really why, you know, there's been leakage um, and problems here. Um, and that's why these teeth have failed, as well as the poor root canal treatments. So with perforations, when you're looking at how restorable they are and what sort of prognosis um, that perforation repair is going to have, you need to have a look firstly at the size of the perforation. So smaller perforations have a much better success rate because we have less inflammation that's gone on, um, you know, and less damage to the, uh, to the tissue compared to larger perforations. The time also, so if they have occurred very recently, if you mend a perforation straight away, you've got a much better success rate than if that's been um, left for a long period of time. And the main reason for that is because um, the, uh, you can get secondary perio involvement of that perforation. So if we imagine this tooth here, this tooth is going to have inflammation and infection that occurs at the perforation site. Once that communicates with the oral cavity, we then have a joint perioendo lesion that's very difficult to repair. Um, so time is important and also the location. So the case that I showed you previously of the lower central incisor, that was completely super gingival um, and we could repair that very easily. So very coronal restoration uh, perforations have a good success rate. If that perforation is below um, the, it's still coronal, but below, so supercrestal, uh, su sorry, subcrestal, then the success rate is actually quite poor because that very quickly communicates with the oral cavity. We get a perioendo defect um, and that can cause a problem um, in terms of mending it. Apical perforations actually have a quite a good success rate because again, it takes a long time for the, to communicate um, the infection from the perforation and the oral cavity. Um, so as long as we find the true canal and mend the perforation well, they tend to do quite well. So repairing this case. Um, so the first thing you have to do is clean the perforation site. So we can see here, I've removed any GP, any traces of sealer, um, to make sure that the site is nice and clean. We want to get good hemostasis because we can't put a pop, um, a perforation repair material over something that's bleeding. So we need to try and get good hemostasis. And here I've repaired both of those perforations with biodentine. Now, in this case, I um, wanted to treat the uh, canals in two visits because there was quite a lot of exudate coming um, once I'd uh, actually prepared the canal. Um, so for this case, I repaired the perforation um, and then I left some calcium hydroxide in the canal and a temporary filling. When I came back a couple of weeks later, um, we can see I tested the perforation repairs and they were really nice and solid um, and no leakage that was going on. So I was happy with that. Um, and then I carried on and finished the root canal treatment. So this was preoperatively, um, this was postoperatively. This is at the six month review, and we can see that the lesions are healing nicely. And this was at uh, the one year review, and we can see again, very good resolution of the lesions at this stage. Now for posterior perforations, um, again, the first thing to do is try and prevent, um, prevent the perforation happening. So normally I will create measurements on my preoperative radiograph and measure my burrs accordingly. So the first sort of measurement you want is from the occlusal surface to the pulp roof um, and the occlusal surface to the pulp floor. 
So you know on your burr, you don't want to be going any deeper than that, um, because then we're at risk of creating a perforation. Also, I find this burr really helpful. Um, this is the endo Z burr. It's a non end cutting burr, which means that as soon as we've dropped into the pulp chamber, we can then use this burr and place it within it and then move it just laterally um, to enlarge our access. And we can do it safely knowing that the end is non cutting and it's not going to damage the floor of the um, pulp chamber. So mending posterior perforations. Um, this patient um, presented uh, to me needing repair um, on this tooth here, this upper, um, upper right six. And if we have a look at the cone beam CT, you can see in this moving image here, the GP point has sort of perforated the tooth um, at the level of the MB2. Um, and it's probably because the dentist, um, you know, was looking for MB2 and felt that this was the canal. And if we move along this slice again, you can see that the GP point has come completely outside um, the canal um, at the level of the sort of nearly the, the fication area. So cone beam CTs are, you know, a really useful tool when treating complex um, endodontic cases. Um, they sort of give you a roadmap of what you're expecting um, and also gives you a chance to sort of tell the patient, you know, what the prognosis is and um, plan the treatment. So this is what it looked like when I had removed um, the GP point from the perforation site. Um, so this is MB1 here, this is palatal, um, and uh, this distal buckles over here, and this is where the um, MB2 perforation site was. So the GP point came out nice and intact. And the main thing you need to do before mending the perforation is actually locate the additional canal. So this is where the CBCT came in um, good use. I could see that there was an MB2. Um, so I know that I have to find that prior to mending um, the perforation because otherwise I'll block the entrance to MB2 as well. So I found MB2 and fully prepared it. So at this point, I've repeated the full root canal treatment and I've not yet mended the perforation. Um, I think that this was the best way to handle this case because again, we had to um, fully prepare MB2 to prevent blocking it when we mended the perforation. Um, but you do have to be careful with your hypochlorite syringe. Um, you don't want to be sort of injecting it into the perforation site. So you really have to be careful and watch where you're putting that when you're sort of treating cases like this. After that, um, this is the biodentine that went in. I've got good hemostasis of my perforation um, and we've got biodentine repairing it. Once the 12 minutes is up and it's set, I covered this with um, a resin modified GIC. So I'll just go back. Covered this with a resin modified GIC and restored it straight away with a composite restoration. Um, this was all done in one visit, um, but actually I would probably change the way I manage it now um, and put a much thicker layer of biodentine in and then use um, a composite directly on the top of that. This is um, quite an interesting case. Um, it, uh, this sort of gentleman sort of presented to me with um, a large buckle swelling, continuous pain since he'd had this upper six root treated. Um, he had a crown on the top of it um, that was done after the root canal treatment was done. When I removed the crown and the coronal restoration, this is where I found there was a huge perforation on the pulp floor. And at this stage, I told the patient, actually this tooth has a very poor prognosis long-term. Um, firstly, because, you know, it's difficult to mend perforations of this size. And secondly, because the tooth um, is at higher risk of fracture in the future. I mean, he was very keen to save his tooth and he sort of said, Karina, look, I understand um, the risks that you're telling me, but I would like you to try. Um, so we did, I, I went ahead and I, I tried to do this. Now I've got a short video. Um, this is the initial layer of biodentine that's already been placed. Um, it was difficult to get hemostasis here. This is an amalgam plugger actually delivering the next load of biodentine. So I'm not packing at all. I'm just sort of very gently pushing the material to the sides. This is a little bit heroic. I wouldn't fully you know, expect people to mend perforations of this size um, all the time. It's a, it's a very heroic case. I'm just using a cotton pledget here to sort of manipulate the material along, along the walls. This is after 12 minutes. And I'm having a gentle feel. Again, the, um, the resistance, the, you know, the seal of this takes a little while to develop. So I'm very gently testing it here. And once, it, once this had happened, I then repeated the root canal. And again, I finished this case in one visit. 
I'm going to be showing you the results of this case in a minute, but I firstly want to talk about the push out strength of um, biodentine. Now, this is really an important property when mending perforations um, because, you know, once we're, we're sort of placing the material, we don't want it to be pushed out um, of, the, of the perforation repair. And it has to have sufficient strength to prevent dislodgement. So the push out strength of biodentine, um, like many of its properties, increases with time. What we know that it's um, from studies is that it's slightly less affected by blood contamination than other materials, um, such as MTA. And the studies are a little bit mixed, but most studies show that it has a slightly higher push-out strength compared to MTA. And one of the good properties about it is that once it's had its initial set, you can use sodium hypochlorite and other irrigating um, solutions on it and um, without causing too many problems with the biodentine. So this was um, preoperatively and this was um, postoperatively. Um, so after about three months, so actually, the week after I did the um, retreatment, the patient's buccal swelling had fully resolved, but I wanted to wait a little bit longer because I was quite hesitant, actually, um, you know, for him to get to spend more money on this crown to get a new crown um, until I was sure that things were um, working, or at least relatively sure. So at three months, he, he was um, in a temporary crown for three months, and at three months, everything was asymptomatic. So I advised him to get a new crown on the tooth. Um, still warning him, you know, actually, this may cause problems long term. Um, you know, it's a quite a heroic treatment that we've attempted here. Um, and this is when I saw him at three years. Um, so we can see that the palatal um, lesion is fully resolved. All the lesions are actually resolving very beautifully um, and the crowns um, fitting nicely. So this is him um, at the three year review. I just took these photos the other week um, when I reviewed him. Um, and you can see he's got no buckle swelling, he had no fication pocketing, um, everything is looking really nice and sound. And this is his um, post-operative CBCT. So you can see on here, we've got um, bone directly onto the perforation repair. As I scroll up here, we can see um, good bone in the fication. And even on this view down here, we can see that the bone has sort of grown almost directly onto the biodentine repair. Um, so we got very fortunate in this case. Um, things, um, you know, things worked well, but I, I think that there's no other material really that you can mend a perforation that size with apart from something like biodentine. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you um, enjoyed uh, the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, obviously, please ask. Um, and I've also um, got a Facebook and Instagram page um, that if you need to ask me any questions later on that you think of, I'd be happy if you, any of you messaged me. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Thank you for sharing your cases with us. Um, it was really, really interesting. I, we received already some comments. Thank you for all this great clinical case review. Excellent work on the perforation. So congrats okay. again for this, for this lecture. Uh, some questions. Um, can a patient experience symptoms during the formation of the dentin bridge? So there is an example just after. Example, a patient has symptoms of reversible pulpitis. He receives an indirect pulp cap, then has a one or two day history of irreversible pulpitis. Um, would you give a tooth, um, would you give a tooth a benefit of a dot and wait or dive into the pulp given the symptoms of irreversible pulpitis? So um, if a patient has irreversible pulpitis, um, ideally we shouldn't be doing an indirect pulp cap. For these cases, we should be doing um, either a partial pulpotomy um, or a full pulpotomy or root canal treatment. So it's um, it, for, for reversible pulpitis, it's a better idea to do an indirect pulp cap. But for, reverse, for irreversible pulpitis, we know that there is some inflammation already in the pulp that's you know, irreversibly inflamed. We know that from the Rikuchi study that if they complain of irreversible pulpitis, it's likely that that pulp is in a, a quite a damaged state. Um, so you do need to actually do a partial pulpotomy or a full pulpotomy in these sorts of cases. Um, if you have a patient with a reversible pulpitis um, and you do an indirect pulp cap um, and they still have problems a couple of days later, I would then give that the benefit of the doubt maybe for a couple of weeks um, and see how that goes. Because sometimes you can get um, 
you know, uh, the tooth can be a little bit symptomatic after these sorts of procedures. Um, so I would wait a little bit longer for those sorts of ones. But uh, if, like I said, if you've got irreversible pop fighters, then we, we shouldn't really be doing an indirect pop cap. Um, how far do you go into pulp for partial pulpotomy? Um, so normally a couple of millimetres, um, maybe take about, about two to three millimetres of the coronal pulp tissue away. Um, you're going to be doing this with a fast handpiece and a sterile burr. Um, and then try and get hemostasis. So with the cotton pledget, um, which has been soaked in the sodium hypochlorite, place that. And if you still have bleeding after two minutes, um, you know, when you remove that after two minutes, if you still have bleeding, then I would take a couple more millimetres away. So another two millimetres and repeat the procedure because a healthy pulp shouldn't bleed too much. Um, it should sort of have a two minutes and then it, then it will be okay. What are your thoughts on treating an open apex? Is biodentin easily placed at the apex? Yes, it's, um, it's a very good use for um, biodentin. Um, obviously it set, the, the full set from when you mix the material to when the material initially sets is 12 minutes. So you just have to make sure that this is the sort of time frame you have because normally with apexification, you put your initial in increment in, and I normally check it with a, a radiograph. So you just need to make sure, obviously, that procedure is done quite quickly, so you have time to adjust the biodentin plug if you need to. But yeah, it's a fantastic procedure. Um, it's fantastic material for apexification. So oh, um, thank you for this great webinar. Uh, how does the micro-mechanical aspect of a biodentin dentin seal form, what is the mechanism of, on, of its formation? Oh, that's quite a technical question. Um, and I'm sure there is better people to answer that than me. But from what I know, um, it's a sort of a, a very active site between the dentine and the biodentine. Um, so it, we have this um, either ion exchange that occurs between the biodentine and dentine um, or crystal growth that occurs between the two. So you get an excellent seal um, between the two materials. It's mainly micro-mechanical. Uh, so a comment? Yeah, yeah, that, thank you. Yeah, that's all right. Yes. Yeah. A small comment for people uh, having uh, missed the first part. Yes, you can uh, watch again after the, the webinar. Don't worry. Uh, another question, if there is granulation tissue in the furcation, do you have to curate this out prior to placing biodentin or is the tooth unrestorable if this is the case? Um, then that's probably unrestorable. So if you have um, a lot of granulation tissue um, and infection um, in that area, that's got a, quite a poor success rate. Um, but, but if the if the tissue, I mean, you probably saw in the case that I showed here, that was a large perforation. You can see what the tissue looked like. Um, that wasn't granulation tissue, so I wouldn't curatage that out. I would just place it directly onto that. But if you've got sort of a, a big hole underneath the perforation where you've already had perio involvement in that area, that perforation repair is very unlikely to um, occur, and I would probably consider extraction of that tooth. Do you routinely use a collagen barrier for perforation repair? No, I don't. Um, have I ever? I don't think I've ever used um, a collagen barrier for perforation repairs, actually. I prefer directly to put the biodentine down. I do use it because um, it's mainly because I want to make sure that I have good hemostasis um, before. So I make sure that that's, that's, that occurs, but I don't use the collagen barrier. But I do frequently use a, a collagen barrier for apexification cases. So where I've got a very wide open apex, I find there that a barrier works very well. Thank you, Dr. Patel. We are coming to the end of the, of the lecture. I think that all the attendees enjoy your lecture. Thank you again. Thank you Thank all you to be here today. Thank you very uh, much. A, Thank you. Have a nice day or a good evening. And stay tuned for the next uh, Septodon webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.